again guys, welcome back to the channel. In today's video it is the big one, the one I'm sure that many of you have been waiting for. We'll be taking a look at the PMDG DC6. For those of you who are perhaps unfamiliar with PMDG, they are regarded by many as one of the best developers of Microsoft Flight Simulator software. More specifically they're well known for creating a series of high fidelity Boeing aircraft for FSX and P3D. They did also produce the DC6 for both of those platforms as well as bringing it into X-Plane and now it's finally arrived into Microsoft Flight Simulator. I think that many of us are anticipating that the PMDG aircraft starting to arrive into Microsoft Flight Simulator will hopefully be a watershed moment for the sim. So in today's video we're going to try and assess whether that is indeed the case. As usual for my reviews we'll first take a look at the external modelling and texturing of the aircraft. We'll then head inside and do the same. We'll briefly take a look at the onboard EFB provided by PMDG and then we'll start running through all of the relevant procedures to get the aircraft started up and up in the air. Unusually in today's video I do actually have some help. PMDG provide you with a virtual flight engineer for the DC-6. You can of course choose whether or not to use the virtual flight engineer and if you wish you can carry out all of the procedures manually. But in today's video we will be making use of the virtual flight engineer partially to showcase its functionality and also because ultimately it is a more realistic way of operating the aircraft. On top of that we'll be using all of the real world procedures, checklists and charts to carry out our flight from A to B. For the flight today we're currently on the ground at Ted Stevens International Airport located in Anchorage, Alaska and we'll be making a cargo run out towards the northwest up to the town of Nome flying this rather beautiful Everts DC-6. As always guys I do hope you enjoy the video and find it to be of use. Obviously this one is a little bit special. If you like what you see then please consider giving the video a like and subscribing to the channel. If you have any comments or questions for me you can leave those down in the comments section below and I'll always do my best to answer them. But now we'll continue on with our tour of the DC-6, continuing our walk around of the external model. So I probably don't need to tell you, you've probably already noticed for yourself, but overall the PMDG DC-6 is a really beautiful aircraft. PMDG do have a slight head start in as much as the DC-6 is a very naturally pretty aeroplane but I think they've done it complete justice with their rendition of the aircraft. Overall I think the model looks really nice. I know that some of you are much better at looking at the finer details of the airframe and distinguishing whether or not they're accurate but to my mind at least the aircraft certainly looks as it should. Throughout the airframe detailing is generally very good, perhaps not quite the highest that we've seen from any aircraft in the sim to date. But I think similarly to the Aerosoft CRJ, perhaps some details just having to be tweaked down slightly to help save on FPS. You'll probably have noticed already that the aircraft comes with a whole host of external fixtures and fittings which can be turned on and off via the onboard tablet. Pretty commonplace now in Microsoft Flight Simulator but certainly nice to have. All of the doors are animated as well and it's nice to see that the actuation times seem to be broadly in line with the real aircraft. There are lots of nice little touches and attentions to detail, for example in the cargo hold we do actually have some cargo on board and it's generally modelled quite nicely. Similarly if we head inside the aircraft you can see that we have cargo in the cargo area and again overall the internal modelling not too bad. All this being said the external modelling and texturing is not perfect. The DC-6 seems to be yet another Microsoft Flight Simulator aircraft that really pushes the boundaries in some respects but just falls slightly short on some of the texturing. Here for example you can see the riveting in the panel lines actually quite low resolution and the window of the aft cargo bay actually seems to be 2D in terms of its modelling which I haven't actually seen on any add-on aircraft for quite some time. So that's a little bit unexpected, obviously not ideal but again I think it's probably been done in an effort to save on the FPS. A fairly trivial detail to some including myself but obviously it's not ideal. But overall the PMDG DC-6, a real triumph I would say both in terms of its modelling and texturing externally. I think it looks absolutely wonderful, it really conveys the majesty of the aircraft and it looks even better once we get it up in the air. So we'll now head into the cockpit and we'll take a look in there. Coming up the main stairs and you can already see the attention to detail given to the DC-6 internally. We're not yet even in the cockpit itself and already the modelling and the texturing really rather exquisite. Lots of nice little details here although it looks like someone hasn't been doing a very good job of keeping the cockpit tidy. At the rear of the entrance we have the circuit breaker panel, all of which are modelled and work correctly. 
You can also turn on or off random CB failures via the onboard tablet. Not the first aircraft to do this in Microsoft Flight Simulator but still very impressive and certainly the most complex aircraft to date where we have such systems modelled. Anyway coming now into the cockpit and for me this is really the DC-6's tour de force. Generally speaking the cockpit once again absolutely exquisite both in terms of its texturing and modelling and of course its systems. We'll touch more later on on the aircraft systems for now we're just focusing on the texturing and the modelling itself. But overall as you can see once again for yourselves the cockpit done to a really high standard. Quite possibly the best cockpit that we've seen so far in the sim to date. The aircraft probably does look pretty complicated on first viewing and certainly it lacks some of the layout and finesse that more modern aircraft have. But by using the Virtual Flight Engineer and also the excellent tutorial series from PMDG you'll soon get a grip on the DC-6. Pretty much every switch, every control is operable and behaves as you would expect, it functions correctly. Really one of the only exceptions to this are the aircraft's historical radio units. They're currently inoperable and instead PMDG have given us some Bendix radio units just below the overhead panel. Again though for me I think the DC-6 is the nicest aircraft that we've seen in the sim to date when it comes to the cockpit, I think it's really a work of art. Not only does it look great but it also feels very immersive and once we have the aircraft fired up it feels really alive as well. Once again though the cockpit isn't perfect, there are some concessions that have been made. You can see for example just down by the first officer's footwell we do have some 2D texturing. Which again by modern Microsoft Flight Simulator standard certainly doesn't look to be anything special. And lastly taking a look at the night lighting options. Really there are almost infinite lighting options available on the aircraft with a multitude of rotary switches spread throughout the virtual cockpit. These allow you to dim and adjust a number of lights as you desire. But for the sake of the video I'll just show you the main lighting schemes available via the EFB tablet options. Anyway that just about covers the virtual cockpit so we'll now move on and take a closer look at the aforementioned EFB. So we'll take a look at the PMDG onboard tablet. As you can see that provides us with a series of options for the aircraft. Firstly the ramp manager page and as you can see we can select various external items on the outside of the aircraft as you would have seen during our external tour of the model. Similarly we can open up all of the various aircraft doors. We have a few options for the aircraft state. We have cold and dark, ready for start and ready for taxi which is really nice if you're not too familiar with the aircraft then you can have it ready to go and get straight up in the air. And similarly, if you're a bit pressed for time, you can get the aircraft fired up straight away and you won't have to worry about running through all of the procedures. We also have some cockpit lighting options, which is a nice idea. You can basically select different lighting configurations. The DC-6's lighting controls are pretty spread around the cockpit and there's not too much logic to them. So again, if you're unfamiliar with the aircraft or you don't have too much time to be looking around for switches, a nice option there to set up the lights as you would wish. Next we have the fuel load manager, pretty self-explanatory this one, basically you can configure your onboard fuel load and your onboard cargo and passenger loading. There's a nice feature here that if you do refuel the aircraft from the menu it will automatically refuel the tanks in the correct order. Next we have our artificial flight engineer, we'll be taking a lot more of a look at this throughout the flight. But basically we have an onboard AI flight engineer who will run through all of the various checklists and procedures for us at each phase of the flight. After that we have our maintenance manager. This allows us to see the various states of repair of the aircraft systems. So for example as you can see we've got the engine condition, the propeller condition and the various hours for which they've been running. We have engine oil quantities as well as various other fluids. The only thing I would say is a little bit strange here, the airframe hours, it actually includes time on the ground. I've only been sat here recording this video on the ground so far, we haven't been up in the air. and already showing 1.07 hours on the airframe which as I say a little bit odd. Next we have our engine stress visualizer, again a nice feature from PMDG. This allows you to see the condition of the engines once they're up and running, showing you various parameters, for example if you're over boosting the engine, you're running the engines too lean, or perhaps for example the carb air temperature getting a little bit low there, and you're at risk of icing. So again if you're not familiar with the aircraft or you're not comfortable reading the information off the gauges, a nice visual overview of the current condition of the aircraft. Lastly we have our aircraft options. Basically we have a few realism options that we can adjust. We have a tablet brightness option as well as an auto brightness function which will automatically dim and brighten the EFB as per the sims lighting conditions. And lastly we have the option to change the GPS and radio configuration. 
We can either have the PMDG Bendix radios, which we'll be using in today's flight, or if you want a little bit of help navigating with the uh, GNS unit, you can select the default Asobo GNS430. And of course, being the default unit, that means we can switch it out for the modded unit, which does add a little bit more functionality, and just goes to increase the fidelity of the aircraft that little bit more. So overall, a very nice tablet, plenty of functionality there. It would have been nice to see a few more options. I'm not sure whether it's possible or not in the sim currently, but it would have been nice to be able to view charts, for example, even to have a PDF viewer, or perhaps just some simple calculation tools for things like top of descent or converting various units. Lastly, it would have been nice, I think, to have the option to set up the fuel and load manager in kilograms, just for people like myself who are using uh, Simbrief and working in kilograms. Of course, we do have the option to turn the tablet off. And similarly, if we don't want the tablet in our field of view, we can stow it away and leave it there. Anyway, that just about wraps up the onboard EFB. We'll now get ourselves comfortable and we'll begin our flight. So welcome on board the PMDG DC-6. We've just got ourselves sat down and comfortable. As I mentioned during the introduction, for today's flight we're going to be making full use of our automatic flight engineer. Primarily because of course the DC-6 is actually a multi-crew aircraft so it's going to be much more realistic having someone helping us with various flows and checklists as we go. But also it's going to allow you to see for yourself just how easy the PMDG DC-6 can actually be to operate even if you're not that familiar with the aircraft and its systems. So shortly we'll get the automatic flight engineer doing his thing and as he goes we'll monitor his actions and we'll listen out for his calls and thereafter we will be ready for the engine start. So with that in mind we'll come down to our onboard tablet, we're already on the AFE tab and we'll hit the before start push button. So as you can see, the AFE will start to run through all of his various flows to get the aircraft set up for the engine start. Completed. Voice recorder. Tasted. Oil coolers and cow flaps. Porter and position. Fuel and fluids. Checked. Pressurization. Set. Manifold and duct pressure. Checked. Radios. Checked. Doors and hatches. Closed. Door warning lights. Out. Gear pins. Removed. Three on board. Seat belts and pedals. Adjusted. Throttles. Set to idle. Propellers. Forward and three. Before start checks complete. Start engines. So we are now ready for the engine start. As you can see, it really is as easy as that if you make full use of the automatic flight engineer. It's a really great tool from PMDG. It makes the aircraft a lot more accessible and it means that you can learn the DC-6 at your own pace. Anyway, again, we are now ready for the engine start. As you'll see, the AFE has already selected the boost pump to low on engine number three, as well as the engine start selector to number three. We've got the igniters on there as well for engine three and the mixture already in the auto rich position. So all we need to do is come up to the overhead panel, we'll hit the start, we'll wait for the prop to turn through 12 blades and the engineer will count that for us. Three. Six. Nine. Twelve. Now we'll now hit the booster coil and the engine primer. And the engine catching. Now we'll just adjust our throttles to maintain below 1000 RPM. Of course checking the engine parameters as we go. We're not too concerned about the oil warning lights at the moment. The oil is still cold and we are running the engine fairly low RPM here as well. So just nudging back on the throttles there. So we'll start engine 2 now. So the engine 2 mixture control lever can go to auto rich. 
Start selector can go to engine number two. Boost pump can go to low. We'll get the igniters on for engine number two. And again, we'll engage the starter. Three. Can't quite see the prop ourselves. Six. Five. Twelve. So again, hitting the booster coil and the primer. And we have a good start on engine number two. So once again, monitoring the RPMs, checking the engine instruments, all looking good there. We'll start engine number four now. So we'll get the mixture lever into the auto rich position. We'll select engine number four. Boost pump can go to low. Get the igniters on. And again, hitting the starter. Three. Six. Five. Twelve. There's our twelve turns to the blade. Boost coil on. And primer on. And we have a good start on engine number four. It's worth noting you would have seen during the EFB tour that we did that there's various options for different realism settings. If you have the engine set to realistic they can be really tricky to get started which is nice to see. Anyway we have good RPM on number four. Again checking the uh, engine T's and P's. They look good. And lastly engine number one. So bring the mixture lever into the auto rich position. Get the igniters on for engine number one. And start selector can go to one. We'll get the boost pump on. And we'll hit the starter. Three. So there go the blades. Six. Five. Twelve. And again engaging the booster coil and the primer. And there goes engine number one. So once again adjusting the throttle to maintain below 1000 RPM. Checking the engine T's and P's we can see our low pressure oil warning lights have now gone out. And that is the startup complete. So once again we can call on our automatic flight engineer to help us out. And we'll get him to run the after start checks. Start selected bus bumps. Off and off. Battery switch. Plane entry. Generators and inverters. Checked and on. Emergency lights. Bombed. Ground power. Removed. After start checks complete. Okay, so the after start checks are complete. We are now ready for the taxi, more or less. Just a few more checks to run, and then we'll be on our way. Okay, so just before we get the aircraft underway, we'll first finish setting the aircraft up for the departure. We've just grabbed the ATIS, they're currently using runway 07 but we're going to take runway 15 just to save on the taxi time. It will mean a little bit of a crosswind but no significant issue there. Altimeters are set. We'll be departing initially using the Tango Echo Delta VOR, that's a frequency of uh, 11315. So we'll get that set up now and we'll be tracking out towards the Mike Charlie Golf VOR, that's 115.5. So we'll tune that in the standby, and we'll tune that up on nav 2 as well. So the radios are set up, we'll be looking for a track of 288 out towards the Mike Charlie Golf VOR, so we'll set that up on the OBS.
And that is set. We'll brief now as again it's going to be a very short taxi out towards uh, runway 15. We'll be flying the Anchorage 9 departure off runway 15 which is basically straight ahead to 600 feet and it'll be a right turn out onto a heading of 201 and thereafter we'll get vectors to join our flight plan track. Climbing straight up to our cruising altitude today which is only 12,000 feet quite a low cruising altitude over towards Nome. For the taxi we'll just exit the apron straight off in front of us and we'll taxi down uh, Romeo for the holding point runway 15. Again it'll be a very short taxi overall. Anyway we are now ready for the departure. We've run through all of our relevant checks. Next checks will be the before takeoff checklist. So the part brake can come off. And we'll just very carefully come up on the engines to get the aircraft rolling. We want to try and avoid going above 1250 really on the engines if we can, just to avoid any harmonisation effects. Anyway, we're all clear on the left. I have to say the aircraft feels really good to taxi. It's um, responding on the rudder pedals exactly as I would expect more or less. I've not flown a DC-6 of course but it feels appropriately heavy. And the amount of rudder input required for the amount of steering angle feels very reasonable. Again all clear on the left. So turning right now onto uh, taxiway Romeo. So again for the uh, departure brief it's the Anchorage 9 departure off runway heading up to 600 feet then a right turn onto a heading of 201 climbing up to an altitude of 12,000 feet and we'll be expecting uh, radar vectors onto our flight plan track. We're not using air traffic control just at the moment as they're not going to give us the runway that we actually want but we'll call up for a uh, flight following once we're in the air. So we'll get ourselves stopped down at the uh, holding point and then we'll carry out the before takeoff checks. So confirmed it is runway 15. Yeah, just gently on the brakes to bring the aircraft to a stop. Again overall the aircraft I'd say really nice in terms of its taxiing. Part brake can go on. And we'll leave the engines there idling below 1000 RPM. So back to our automatic flight engineer, we'll let him run the show with the before takeoff checks. Bruce Pops. Bruce Pops on low. Fuel selector and crossfeed. Main tanks and crossfeed off. Autopilot and carb heat. Off and cold. Hydraulic system. Down. Forward, pressure quantity checked, OK. Flaps 20. Flaps set 20. Windows of turbine. Closed and on. Controls. Dust lock released, free. Pitto heater. On. Mixture and cowl flaps. Reach and locked, set. Transponder. On. Landing lights. So that is the before takeoff checklist complete. We'll just do a quick flight control check ourselves. So let's fall back, fall forward, neutral, fall left, 
Full right. Neutral. And same for the rudder. Full left. Full right. And neutral. It's officially all clear on final. Again, we won't make use of air traffic control just yet. Part brake can come off. We'll get ourselves lined up on the runway. And you can see from the windsock just a little bit of a uh, crosswind out from the west. So again, you can see the panel really vibrating there as we come up into that range that I mentioned before. We don't really want to be up in and around uh, 1250 RPM. So coming back on the throttles there. Now once again, it's runway 15 confirmed. We'll just get ourselves lined up on the runway and then we'll hand things back over to the automatic flight engineer. He'll be managing quite a few things for us during the takeoff. So we are now ready for the takeoff. Just before we depart though, we'll run through all of the actions that we'll be carrying out during the takeoff run, just so that you can follow along. So the first thing to note, our takeoff weight today is actually 79,000 pounds, which puts us below the 87,600 pound weight limit for a wet takeoff. That means we can do a dry takeoff today, so we'll be using 53 inches on the manifold pressure. The automatic flight engineer will be managing that for us. In terms of our V speeds at our current weight, V1 will be 83 knots. VR will be 101 knots and we'll be climbing away at a speed of 165 knots all the way up to our cruising altitude of 12,000 feet. As I say we'll have the automatic flight engineer manage the engines during the takeoff run so we'll set that shortly. We'll be holding the aircraft on the brakes up until we see 40 inches manifold pressure and then we'll release the brakes and begin the takeoff run. Rotation you'll notice it'll be a very slight rotation we'll be rotating up to a nose up angle of around 5 degrees to give us our acceleration initially and then climbing away as I say at a speed of 165 knots. As you can see we do have some terrain on the departure and again for the uh, departure routing it will be 600 feet a uh, right turn out onto a heading of 201. So part brake can come off as I say we'll hold the aircraft on the brakes and we'll hit the takeoff dry push button to get the flight engineer to start carrying out his actions. 30 inches stabilise. 30 inches stabilise. So he'll bring the engines up to 30 inches to stabilise. Keeping a good eye on the T's and P's. There's 30 inches. 30 inches, stabilised. Parameters looking Cal good. Cal flaps. Cal flaps set. Full power please. Going full power. So he's coming up to our 53 inches manifold pressure. We're just waiting for 40 inches. There's 40 feet off the brakes. And our job now is just to keep the aircraft straight on the runway. Four power set. We'll periodically glance at the engines just to make sure everything's good there. There's 83 knots, that's V1. And 101 rotate, so gently coming back on the stick. The aircraft very gently and nicely coming off the runway. So again, we just want to keep a very shallow climb angle initially until we hit 165 knots. Flight engineer continuing to uh, carry out his checks for us.
I'd say the sim looking absolutely wonderful. Okay, so he's setting meto power now, which is maximum engine power except for the takeoff. And there's 165 knots, so we can now start to uh, climb. We're through our 600 feet, so we'll start our turn onto a heading of 201. And as you can hear, he's now bringing the engines back to climb power. Climb power is set. Have to take off checklist, please. After take off checks complete. So the after takeoff checks are complete. I have to say the aircraft is a complete joy to hand fly. It flies really nicely. And similarly on the uh, takeoff run, the rudder felt really good there, not overly sensitive by any means. Anyway, we're on our heading of uh, 201 now. We'll assume we've been given vectors by air traffic control. So we'll come onto our flight plan track, which is a course of 288 out from the Tango Eka Delta VOR. So we'll come onto about a heading of uh, 300 until we intercept the course out from Tango Eka Delta. Again, keeping a good eye on our T's and P's there. Radial engines have nowhere near the same reliability as uh, jet engines, so even more important that we keep a good eye on all of our engine parameters. But again, yeah, the aircraft really nice to hand fly. It's very stable. Feels very much as I would expect in terms of responsiveness on the controls. It's not overly sensitive does have a feeling of weight to it. Also really easy, once you've got it trimmed it will just sit exactly where you put it. So we're on a heading of uh, 300 degrees now, we'll just track that until we intercept the uh, radial off the Tango Eka Delta VOR. Speed's looking good there, so the aircraft pretty nicely trimmed at the moment. And again just continuing to check those T's and P's. Pretty straightforward for us today as we're only climbing up to an altitude of uh, 12,000 feet. We'll just be maintaining uh, 165 knots and our uh, current engine power settings all the way up till our uh, cruising altitude. You can see we're doing about 1,000 feet a minute rate of climb at the moment. Just coming up on 5,000 feet. And the RMI needle there, showing a little ways to go before we come on to our uh, planned radial. Just coming up through the first cloud layer now, the uh, outside air temperature. Getting down towards zero degrees Celsius now, so keep a good eye on the OAT there. We might have to get the anti-icing systems on at some point as we come up through the next cloud layer in front of us. The RMI needle still showing about uh, 250 at the moment, so still a ways to go before we come on to our radial. And just come up through 6,000 feet now. Take a look over at our pressurisation systems. So we've set 12,000 feet. Looks like the system is targeting a cabin altitude of around 2,000 feet. And currently we're still pretty much at sea level on the cabin altitude. Cabin differential pressure is still coming up there at the moment. So we'll continue to uh, monitor that. Just drifting slightly right of our heading there. Come back onto a heading of 300. And we'll call up now uh, Anchorage Approach. We'll request that flight following, so 126 decimal 4. Alpha Kilo 5 7, feet. Request flight following. Air 
Hello, Squawk 2654. And back to out. Okay, so he has this radar identified, the QNH is set correctly. Interestingly, the altimeter actually in uh, hectopascals there and not inches, which given that it's an American aircraft and everything else seems to be using American units is a little bit strange. You can see the radial just starting to come in there now. So we'll very shortly turn on to our uh, heading of 288. And coming up through 9,000 feet, so 3,000 feet to go. Again, I've got the aircraft nicely trimmed hands off the controls at the moment and it's staying exactly where I put it. It's really nice, very pleasant, stable aircraft to fly. Almost like I've got the autopilot in here, but I haven't. A little bit of a jump there in the uh, altimeter. Anyway, just come up through uh, 10,000 feet. Just come onto our radial now. And coming nicely onto our heading. We'll select DME2, that'll give us a distance out towards the uh, Mike Charlie Golf VOR. We'll use that for now for the DME. And we'll contact centre. Okay, so that's exactly what we're doing. We're uh, now on flight plan track. We've got the altimeters set. 1,000 feet to go. Just adjusting the heading slightly out to the left here just to maintain the radial. We'll stay on the Tango Echo Delta VOR for now. And when we're halfway between the two VORs, we'll switch over to the Mike Charlie Golf. And just starting to come up on our cruise altitude, so we'll start reducing that rate of climb. Looks like we're still going to be below the second cloud layer, which is nice. That should keep us out of any significant icing. We'll get the aircraft leveled off, we'll get the gyro pilot in. And then we'll get the automatic fly engineer to set up cruise power. Once again, the aircraft really easy to fly. I've leveled off pretty nicely there and now trimming the aircraft. And again, it's sitting exactly where I put it. It doesn't show any of the overly sensitive tendencies that we do get from a lot of Microsoft Flight Simulator aircraft. Anyway, we'll get uh, cruise power in. Set cruise power, please. Setting cruise power. So once again, the flight engineer pulling the uh, throttles back there, getting us set up nicely for the cruise. We're more or less trimmed now, so we'll get the gyro pilot on. So first thing we'll do, we'll turn it on. And you can see it is now ready. We'll engage the mechanical clutch. Just come slightly back on the wheel there just to uh, have us levelling off. 
come back up to exactly 12,000 feet. So cruise check's complete. Just come slightly back there again on the wheel. Look at altitude hold on. Acknowledge the radio call. Click spot may be just a tiny bit fiddly, while it's being pedantic. So once again, continue as planned. First things first, just how nice is the uh, sim looking there? sandwich between these two cloud layers that's pretty awesome anyway we are now nicely established in the cruise we're tracking our radial out towards the uh, Mike Charlie Golf VOR maintaining 12,000 feet have a quick look at the engine temperatures and pressures everything looking pretty good there we're burning about 600 pounds of fuel per engine at the moment T's and P's all looking good and cabin pressurisation looking good there, we're doing about uh, 2,000 feet there now on the cabin altitude. So we are nicely established in the cruise. As usual we'll head outside the aircraft, we'll take in some of the external views as we cruise our way northeast up towards Nome. We'll take more of a look at the external model of the aircraft as well. And then I'll come back to you once again just before top of descent, we'll get the aircraft configured for the arrival into Nome. So welcome back to the flight deck. We're just coming over the bay north of Unilaclete at the moment, heading in towards Nome. Coming up on about 70 miles to run towards Nome, which if the PMDG ground school taught me anything, should be about the correct distance to be starting our descent very shortly. To do that we'll first take out the altitude hold on the uh, gyro pilot. And then we'll slowly put the aircraft into a 1,000 feet per minute rate of descent. Leaving the power exactly where it is for now. So 
so just easing that gyro pilot wheel forward until we see our 1,000 feet per minute range of descent. So there's our descent rate, we'll keep the aircraft coming down, as I say we'll keep cruise power for now. Basically we're working on 5 miles per 1000 feet to lose for our descent distance and I've added an extra 20 miles on there as well, just to give us plenty of time to get the aircraft slowed down. I want to take a nice conservative approach to this today, not being all that familiar with the aircraft. Anyway, as I say we're inbound towards Nome at the moment, 65 miles to run now, we're planning on the ILS runway 28 at Nome. So we'll start briefing and getting set up for that. So for the ILS itself, the frequency is 108.7. We have that set on the uh, standby. Final approach course is 279, so we'll set that up later on. Aerodrome elevation is uh, 38 feet. And the uh, MDA is 272. Missed approach. Climb to 1100 feet and then left turn, climb to 3000. In terms of the terrain, there is some high terrain out to the north. The MSA out to the north is 4,800 feet. We're coming in from the south though, so the MSA there is 2,000 feet. For now, we'll descend down to the en route Mora, which is 3,400. And then once we're within uh, 25 miles, we'll descend down to 2,000. Weather's absolutely fine there. It's much the same as we had out of uh, Anchorage. As you can see, the sun is starting to get fairly low on the horizon now, but being summer here in uh, Alaska, we should have uh, daylight conditions for our arrival. Just come slightly forward again on the uh, gyro pilot wheel there, just keep our 1,000 feet per minute. So we've got about uh, 7,000 feet still to lose at the moment, which means we need about 35 miles, plus our extra 20. We should see 55 miles. We've got 58, so looking good there, still on the descent profile. Keep an eye on our speed there as well, of course we want to be below 250 knots at uh, 10,000 feet or lower. Anyway, we've briefed the uh, chart, the weather and the terrain. In terms of our fuel, as you can see we've got just a little bit less than 6,000 pounds of fuel on board. That's actually more than enough to get us back to uh, Anchorage. I planned for the return sector as well to stay with our fuel and Anchorage is indeed our alternate. But not anticipating any need to divert, certainly where the weather is concerned. So anyway, as I say, the uh, plan for the arrival, we're currently coming in on the 274 radial. We'll be coming in on the ILS-28, so it's almost a straight in approach. We'll just peel off slightly to intercept the localizer initially, and then ultimately the uh, glide slope inbound towards Nome. Landing 28, so we'll have to uh, taxi along the runway and then backtrack towards the parking area. Overall, I'd say the aircraft's been an absolute joy to fly all the way over here. It's such a, a lovely, immersive aircraft. It's certainly a really nice experience created here by PMDG. The aircraft really feels alive, very much to the same degree as most A2A aircraft do that I've come across, and that's a very hard thing to achieve. It's not too many aircraft in flight simulation that do manage to pull that off. Anyway, coming from there, 8,000 feet now, so we've still got 5,000 feet to lose, 25 miles to run, plus our extra 20, should be about 45 miles, so getting slightly low on the profile here, we'll uh, ease off on that descent rate. For now, we'll come back to around 700 feet per minute rate of descent. And have a quick glance up at our pressurisation as well. Cabin altitude is now 1,000 feet, and the cabin vertical speed there, as you can see, decreasing. So the pressurisation system seems to be doing its job there. Speed's still good at the moment, we're doing about 245 knots here in the descent, so we'll leave the uh, climb power in just a little bit longer. Inbound to and show about 11 minutes now to run towards Nome.
It's coming up on 5,000 feet now, so we'll start running the descent checks. 26 inches, please. Sitting 26 inches. See the flight engineer there bringing the power back on the engines. 26 inches, sit. Descent check, please. please. Automatism flight instruments. Cross checked. Seat belt signs on. On. So our automatic flight engineer has just completed the descent checks and just passing through four and a half thousand feet now, so 1500 feet before we start the level off. We'll get the aircraft levelled off and then we'll come out on our heading to intercept the uh, radial inbound. And you can see the uh, speed slowly starting to bleed back there now as we bring the thrust off. Looks like we are going to be passing into a little bit of cloud here in the descent. Outside air temperature currently showing just below 10 degrees but we're only going to be very momentarily in the cloud here so we'll uh, just keep an eye on things. If we do notice any ice accumulating then we'll deal with that accordingly. Just periodically flicking over to Nav2 to see if we are picking up the RLS yet. Still not picking it up just at the moment. So as you can see we're coming off about 20 miles to run towards Nome, just coming up on the localizer here as well so we'll get the localizer mode armed on the gyro pilot. We'll leave approach mode disarmed just for now, we'll arm that once we see the glide slope start to move. And we can start configuring the aircraft once the speed's below 174 knots, we're currently doing just below 180. So we'll start managing the speed ourselves, to do that we'll take out the automatic flight engineer. And just bring the throttles back, come back to around 70 BMEP. Speed's 175, so momentarily we can start configuring the aircraft as we wish. Just wait until we come back to 170 and then we'll carry out our in-range checks. Can't make out the airfield just yet, it's pretty tricky though with the uh, late evening conditions here and the sun in our faces off on the uh, western horizon. Okay, there's 170 knots so we'll carry out the in-range checks. And coming off about five miles now to run till we start our descent down the glide slope. So we'll get that speed coming back, we'll take a stage of flap. We'll aim to be back about uh, 140 knots, flaps 20 before we start down the glide path. So there's flaps 10. We can come all the way back to flaps 30 should we wish, below a speed of 174 knots. And we'll go flaps 20. And there's flaps 20 set. Just make out the lead-in lights now for runway 28. Still can't see the runway itself. Temperature-wise we're just passing through a few wisps of cloud here but the uh, temperature's 10 degrees anyway so I think we're okay as far as icing is concerned. 
And that glide slope just starting to come in there now as well, so we'll arm up the approach mode on the gyro pilot. And speed still steadily reducing back to 140 knots. That glide slope intercept will set the automatic flight engineer to carry out the landing checks. Keeping good on the gyro pilot here, making sure it does actually intercept the glide slope. And just beginning the descent now, quite an aggressive pitch down there initially. Be interesting to see how the DC-6 gets on with the ILS, obviously quite a few aircraft in the sim do have their issues. Anyway, we'll carry out those landing checks. Coming back to about 70 BMEP there again. So we have flaps 20 set. We'll go uh, gear down. Now that we're below 152 knots we can fully configure for the landing, just passing over the outer marker at the moment. Our V approach is 128 and our V ref will be 99 knots. You can see the gyro pilot has just put us slightly out to the localizer here. So there's flaps full, we'll come up on the power now to maintain the approach just for now. And we'll disengage the gyro pilot. Start flying manually. Start reducing the power to uh, let the speed bleed back to VREF. Again, trying not to get the throttles below 60 BMEP there. Overall, once again, the aircraft pretty nice to hand fly. It certainly sits there more or less once you've got it trimmed. A few little bumps here on the approach as well, as you can see. Apparently, the DC-6 doesn't need much of a flare, so we'll uh, try and flare accordingly. bit of a balloon there. There's touchdown. Lowering the nose onto the runway. Now we'll just gently start braking. I 
Again, plenty of runway here, so no rush to get the aircraft slowed down. We'll hold fire on the after landing checks until we're clear of the runway. And we'll be vacating off to the right in the parking area as I mentioned earlier. So we'll just cross the, uh, the runway straight ahead of us and it'll be the uh, next right. It'll be the taxiway into the apron. So just checking. It is visually clear left and right. We'll start slowing the aircraft down now for the turn. Hopefully this ground vehicle is going to hold in its present position just for now. We'll just taxi straight ahead park up in front of this building we'll get the aircraft shut down start carrying out those after landing checks after landing checks complete so park brake on and one last task for our automatic flight engineer, we'll get him now to carry out the parking checks. Parking brake is set. Cut engines. So he's cutting the fuel to each of the engines, we'll just monitor those as they run down. It looks like we have four good shutdowns. So the shutdown checks are complete. As we often like to do during reviews, we'll head back up into the air just to look at a few more features of the aircraft. More specifically, we'll be looking at the engine modelling and damage. We'll carry out a stall as well just to assess the aircraft flight model. And once we've carried out those exercises, we'll get ourselves firmly back on the ground. And we'll finish up with my overall thoughts and opinions on the DC-6. So we're establishing the cruise. I've actually just turned the blower or the supercharger up to the high setting on engine number three. Just to show you really the engine modelling and the various effects that we'll see throughout. As you'll see the BMEPs rocketed all the way up to the maximum deflection there on the needle. Likewise the manifold pressures come up to around 55 inches manifold pressure. The RPMs all the way up through 3000. Looking at the cylinder head temperatures there as well. The cylinder head temperature on the number three engine rising. And similarly you'll notice the oil temperature starting to rise on engine number three. And again, this just gives you a good feel. It's a very small example of the overall level of depth that we have in the PMDG DC-6. That oil temperature continuing to rise at the moment, the oil pressure just starting to fall there as well on number three, which would generally be an indication that maybe something's up with the engine anyway. Obviously we've induced the failure here. That oil temperature just about to reach our limit now. The oil pressure continuing to drop. Cylinder head temperature, that's up in the amber band as well now. There's the oil temperature warning light as we go through the limit on the oil temp. Oil pressure going below the limit there now. And the engine letting go, as you can see the BMEP rolling off. Same for the manifold pressure and the RPM. So the engine has failed, it's now shut down. And if we head outside the aircraft, 
We still had the aircraft in the takeoff configuration at the time, so we still had the auto feather turned on. And as you'll see, the propeller has automatically feathered. So again, just a small demonstration of the level of detail in the DC-6 systems, but overall really top notch, really almost no stone has gone left unturned when it comes to the fidelity of the aircraft systems. So one last test that we'll run before we conclude the review. Once again we are in the cruise currently at 13,000 feet and we're going to carry out a power off stall just to see how the aircraft behaves there, see what the flight model does. So we'll just maintain altitude, trimming as we go, letting the speed bleed off. Speed just coming back through 120 knots. Very high nose attitude now as you can see to maintain altitude. Still trimming at the moment, got almost full back stick. So not much buffet there, no real sounds but we did hit the stall, the nose dropped. We instantly dropped the left wing there and now we're in a spin as you can see. It does seem that the spin is slowly tightening up as well. So I'll release the controls. The aircraft not really doing a whole lot to recover from the spin there, so we've got full forward on the stick now, full right rudder. Doesn't seem to be having too much effect on the spin there. Not noticing much of a reduction in rate. It looks like once you get the aircraft into a spin it's going to be more or less unrecoverable. So there you go guys, I hope you enjoyed our Alaskan run from Anchorage up towards Nome in the Everts DC-6. I probably made it fairly clear throughout the flight already, but I have to say I'm mildly blown away by the PMDG DC-6. I think the aircraft is absolutely awesome. It's my first PMDG purchase in many years now actually, and it's nothing to do with them as a developer. I think they do very high quality work, but I've never been a massive fan of the modern Boeing jets. I have to say though I'd forgotten just how brilliant some of their aircraft are, the DC-6 being absolutely no exception. Previously I'd always thought of PMDG as being the best developer for producing accurate aircraft when it came to systems, but A2A were always my go-to guys when I wanted an aircraft that really felt alive. However there's no doubting that PMDG have managed to pull off exactly the same trick here with their DC-6. As usual though we'll break the aircraft down into a little bit more detail discussing both the negatives and the positives of the product. As I generally like to do, we'll start with the negative points and work our way through to the positives. As with pretty much any add-on, whilst the DC-6 is excellent, it still has its flaws for sure. The aircraft has unfortunately one major drawback, the rest of my negative points are really just niff-naff. So of course the aircraft has just released, I've only had a limited amount of time to test it out, and with an aircraft this complex and with so much systems depth and fidelity, it wouldn't really have been feasible to test all of the aircraft systems in their entirety. But as you can see we did carry out a full flight from A to B and the aircraft overall performed admirably. Unfortunately my major gripe with the aircraft has nothing to do with its systems, nothing to do with its texturing or modelling per se. For me by far the biggest negative point with the product at the moment is the FPS hit that I took during the flight. On my system I was experiencing around 24 FPS less than the default Cessna 152. Now of course the DC-6 is a very high fidelity, very complex aircraft and you would expect to see an FPS impact with such a product. But minus 24 FPS is a pretty significant hit, certainly on a system like mine. Ultimately I was getting around 30 FPS flying the aircraft, a little bit less at certain times as you would have seen on the ground in Nome. My system, whilst it is getting on a little bit in age, it's not particularly underpowered, so this will be a product that you'll struggle to run on a lower end machine. Or at the very least you'll really have to dial down the graphics in the sim to run the aircraft smoothly. Hopefully to some degree this will be remedied by the soon to be released DirectX 12 patch for Microsoft Flight Simulator, but as Sobo have said they're not looking to use DirectX 12 to directly enhance the performance of the sim, rather to improve it graphically. So whilst the PMDG DC-6 does certainly mark a turning point in Microsoft Flight Simulator's development, we are now reaching that stage once again where current hardware is struggling to run modern flight simulation software. Unfortunately that's really always been the case in flight simulation and I certainly was expecting to see somewhat of an FPS hit with the DC-6, although I have to say I was a little bit surprised as to quite how high the impact was. Again so far that's the only major negative point that I found with the DC-6 whilst flying the aircraft. The rest of my negative points as I say are much more trivial in nature but we'll still run through them. So the external texturing as we mentioned in a few areas it's definitely a little bit on the low resolution side compared to other Microsoft flight simulator add-ons. 
This does generally tend to be the case, it seems, with the more high fidelity aircraft, for example the Aerosoft CRJ, or the Just Flight Piper Arrow. So I presume that this is developers trying to develop the aircraft such that the FPS hit is at least minimised, and I would imagine that's what's going on here with the DC-6. Personally for me I don't consider it to be a major issue as I generally spend very little time outside of the virtual cockpit anyway when I'm flying in the simulator. But if you are someone that values pristine liveries and immaculate texturing then this point may be of interest to you. There were just a couple of minor inconsistencies that I found in the cockpit. Again the old radio unit's not operable which I think is a little bit of a shame. It would have been nice to have the option to use both. And similarly it would have been nice to have a few more avionics options via the EFB tablet. I am very happy with the avionics setup that PMDG have given us and of course it's period specific. But it would have been nice to switch out the directional gyro with a HSI for example. Perhaps have the option to fit out the cockpit with some more modern instrumentation should you wish to do so. I'm being very picky though and again that is just personal preference. There were also a couple of areas in the cockpit which I think could use some improved sounds. For example when the flight engineer sets the throttles there's no noise there whatsoever. And I imagine in a big old beast like this with big chunky throttles you'd certainly hear some noise there as you're moving them around. Overall the sounds of the aircraft are excellent but it just felt like there were a couple of areas where things could be improved slightly. Similarly it would be really nice to have the option to adjust the sound levels of the virtual flight engineer. For me he was just a little bit quiet, personally I would have liked to have turned the sound levels up a bit, I'm sure people would have their own personal preferences. Again though for an aircraft of this price and with this much fidelity it would be a nice feature to have and presumably wouldn't be too hard to implement via the onboard tablet. My last issue with the aircraft and this is not based on any real world experience once again but the stall did seem to be a little bit meek. Although the nose did drop and we did enter into that spin and I've no idea whether the aircraft would be recoverable or not from a spin in reality. But the actual onset of the stall I thought was a little bit underwhelming, there was no real warning there beforehand. And even more disappointingly there was no visual buffet or audio change, just a fairly sudden and aggressive stall with as I say little to no prior warning. It may be that this is accurate to the real world aircraft but of course without having flown it myself there's no way of knowing and I suspect that in reality there would be some early onset signs of the stall. Overall though that just about wraps up my negative points of the product, really in all other areas I can't sing the PMDG DC6's praise highly enough. My first major point of praise for the product is that it's currently retailing at 55 US dollars. Of course this is still a lot of money for what is essentially a virtual aircraft, but that's certainly very competitive with other products in the sim. Frankly it's a lot cheaper than I think many of us were expecting. And hats off to PMDG for offering a relatively affordable, really high quality product. It might be a pricey one but the level of quality more than justifies the cost in my opinion. So the price once again definitely a big plus point. As I say really almost everything about the aircraft when it comes to its systems, its flight modelling, its handling, its immersion, its ambience, all getting a big thumbs up from me. I really enjoyed my time out in the aircraft, I thought it was a joy to fly. The systems seem to be incredibly in depth. The sounds are really good for the most part as I mentioned and they add to a real feeling of immersion. And just the aircraft systems combined with those sounds, as I said, the airframe felt really alive, which again is a very hard feat to accomplish in any add-on really. The gyro pilot for the most part worked very admirably, that seemed to work as expected. We did see that it put the aircraft slightly out to the right of the localizer there. I have done a few other ILS approaches and they all worked okay, so I'm not sure if we just got unlucky there, or whether the aircraft does still suffer some issues with the ILS, as per every other aircraft in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Again that is ultimately a sim issue but it would be nice to see this get fixed by either a Sobo or a developer at some point. I think the modelling of the engines was the real icing on the cake for me when it came to the aircraft systems. Each engine really does feel like a unique entity, all of the gauges showing slightly different parameters here and there. And obviously we did look at an extreme example there with the engine failure but as you can see if you mishandle the engines you will see all of the relevant parameters as you would expect and the engine will ultimately fail. Whilst the DC-6 can be quite a demanding aircraft to fly, once again the virtual flight engineer an absolute winner for me that makes managing the aircraft much more accessible to everybody coming on board. He obviously does a lot of the hard work so that you don't have to and again it really allows you to learn the aircraft at your own pace. Similarly if you haven't seen them already PMDG have an excellent series of tutorials on how to fly the aircraft available on their YouTube page. I highly recommend you go and check those out, they really help me to learn the aircraft. If I did make any mistakes today then of course we blame it entirely on them. But joking aside, once again it is a really great series, it breaks down the aircraft into very manageable chunks. And just watching the entire series through once I was more or less able to come onto the aircraft and be familiar with what was going on. So at the start of the review we somewhat asked ourselves the question, 
Whether or not the PMDG DC-6 is going to be a seismic shift in Microsoft Flight Simulator as a realistic simulation platform, I think that we can say by and large the DC-6 is a resounding success when it comes to answering that question. For me the Just Flight Arrow series was really the first set of aircraft that we had in the sim that really took Microsoft Flight Simulator to a whole new level, and the PMDG DC-6 is doing for civil aviation what Just Flight did for general aviation. The aircraft isn't just excellent but it's also really good fun to fly. So if you do have a fairly beefy computer, an interest in classical airliners or perhaps radial engines, or if you just have a desire to roll your sleeves up and really get down into the books and the nitty gritty of the aircraft systems, then I can't really recommend checking out the PMDG DC-6 highly enough. As always guys I do hope you enjoyed the video and found it to be of use. If you did please consider giving the video a like and subscribing to the channel. If you have any comments or questions for me you can leave those down in the comments section below and once again I'll always do my best to try and answer them. As always thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all again soon.